Now that technique that will be used by the command module pilot, John Young, we can go out to uh, Downey, California, the North American Rockwell's plant there where correspondent Bill Stout and test astronaut Leo Krupp were standing by. Gentlemen. Walter, I think Leo can give us a pretty good idea of what they have to go through in this rendezvous. Once they get in sight of each other, I guess technically, Leo, it is rendezvous, even though they may be a good distance apart. Well, the rendezvous phase will start at 100 feet, and then the, the lunar module will fly into very close proximity to the command module, up to within maybe three or four feet, actually, of, of the command module, before the lunar module will go into attitude hold. The command module will then become the active vehicle for the, for the actual docking. Now, on Apollo 9, Jim McDivitt stayed active in the lunar module all the way in and did an active limb docking. But as you remember, he had quite a bit of difficulty because our target is very small in the command module and he had trouble lining it up. But on the lunar module, we have a very nice big target, as you can see here. Now, in looking at this target at the present time, you can see that we're a little bit too far to the left. So the first thing John will do is translate his vehicle to the right until he gets that standoff cross superimposed on the back cross. That'll give him the proper line of sight for the docking. And then the lighted reticle that you see is the COAS or the uh, crewman's optical alignment sight. Now this tells him if he has the proper vehicle attitude. Now actually our nose is pointed a little bit high and to the right. So he'll take the rotation hand controller and he'll maneuver the vehicle in attitude to bring that COAS reticle down right on the docking target. Now when the COAS reticle is on the target, and the cross is superimposed it is, as it is right now. We have all conditions satisfied for docking. He will then start to move in on the lunar module at about 0.25 feet per second, very slowly, until the probe and drogue mate, and he's in a soft dock condition. Walter, I was talking with Leo a few days ago about that circle of dots. You see the light dots and the black circle around the standoff T? Those are radioactive material, Leo. That's right. They're a reflective material, Bill, and we have them on there in case it's necessary to do a docking in, in darkness. Now, we also have a docking light on the, uh, on the command module located outside the command module above our heads, which will shine on this target. And if we had to do a docking in, in darkness, these dots would illuminate, and we could actually see the target well enough to, to do a, a, darking, a docking on the dark side. Well, the reason, Walter, for using radioactive material in those dots is uh, visibility, obviously, perhaps in the blackness of the far side of the moon. And yet, the restrictions that our government lays down on radioactive material are so severe that many of the astronauts had a hard time getting close to the radioactive material they might face for the first time in outer space. The rules about using radioactive stuff of that sort on Earth are, are that stringent. And I guess there were a good many meetings before they finally got around to the point where they actually showed the astronauts the kind of radioactive dots they could expect someday to meet in the blackness of outer space. Have any idea, uh, Bill, why they had to go to a radioactive material rather than the kind of fluorescent stuff we use here on Earth and bumper stickers and everywhere else? Leo, it won't work, will it? Well, I don't know the technical reason why, Walter, but I think the problem was we had a more reliable reflector in this type of material is the reason they went to it. And uh, the simulations we've run on the actual docking targets have been very satisfactory, so it is doing the job. It's one more of those mysteries of the, uh, the airless, uh, weightless atmosphere of space. They found that radioactive materials do work, and they're not too sure about those things that uh, people put on your bumper, Walter, and mine. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bill, for the rea uh, reassurance tonight. Well, uh, they're on the far side of the moon, but if all has gone well, they're now within 100 feet of each other, and they'll be uh, reacquiring a signal here in about nine minutes for the docking maneuver a little later on. This is Walter Cronkite at the CBS News Space Center. Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters in New York, correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good evening. All's going well now with Apollo 10. With another critical moment yet to come, just about 20 minutes from now, the flight of Apollo 10, though, momentarily cast the first shadow over July's scheduled Apollo 11 flight that would put man on the moon for the first time. At 11.21 tonight, about uh, 106 hours since their liftoff Sunday and 20 minutes from now, the LEM is scheduled to dock with the command module 
which will then return astronaut Stafford, Young, and Cernan to Earth, beginning on Saturday and for a splashdown Monday. But earlier tonight, there was a brief moment of doubt about that shot in July. More important, a question then of concern for astronauts Stafford and Cernan and their own safety there in Snoopy. As they fired to get rid of their descent stage just 13 miles above the moon, the LEM went into wild gyrations. Now, these are self-controlled men, as we've learned up there in space, but you could hear the tension in the voice of Gene Cernan when he reported that it felt like we were going all over the landscape. And we heard nothing from Stafford as he fought the controls to bring those gyrations under control. And through those dramatic moments, you had to ask if 11 could go on schedule, if this first uh, rendezvous in Luber lunar orbit uh, demonstrated something that uh, we didn't know. However, Mission Control in Houston now says that the frightening moments, and they were certainly frightening to all of us, resulted from a technical oversight regarding a switch, nothing more. So after that first major scare of this epic flight, we're waiting to bring you history's first manned docking in a lunar atmosphere. At this moment, we're waiting for them to come around from the far side of the moon. The acquisition of signal could come in about five minutes from now, and then we expect them to confirm that they have matched their velocities, this lunar module and the command module, the lunar module flying up from its low point 13 miles there above the moon to rejoin the command module. Their velocities matched 100 feet apart that they are station keeping and that they are prepared to go ahead at 11:19 tonight with the docking what happened earlier this evening at 7:33 this evening to be precise eastern daylight time as they were just at that point 13 and a half miles over the moon one of the most critical points of the flight because they didn't have very much maneuvering room uh, working at 3700 miles an hour that close to the moon's surface they cut loose the descent stage of this two-stage uh, lunar module leaving the uh, two pilots in the ascent stage to come back for the rendezvous but as they cut loose that descent stage, suddenly the, the ascent stage in which the astronauts were gyrated wildly. What they said was, well, what Cernan said was a bad word. Uh, actually, it was the first we, word we had that there was any trouble. He said, son of a gun or something very like that. And then he went on to say, there are wild gyrations here. And then he said, it just took off on us uh, as we jettisoned the descent stage, he meant. He went on to say, I thought we were wobbling all over the sky. We were hearing only from CERN and then brief bursts of, uh, of uh, reports from him, very little from the ground and nothing from Stafford as he fought the controls. And a little later on, Cernan said, boy, I don't know what the hell that was, baby. I tell you, there was a moment there. And then he went on to say, but we'll like, wait and talk it over a little bit later. Well, it, they found out what it was, but for a moment, uh, everyone was frightened that the whole safety of those two astronauts and of all of our moon landing program uh, was in considerable jeopardy. They can tell us what the solution was, and it came very shortly thereafter. Uh, out at uh, Grumman Aircraft, where they build this lunar module, and where they were holding their breath too, like all of us here on Earth, uh, our Chaps out there are correspondent Nelson Benton and test astronaut for Grumman, Scott McLeod. Gentlemen, what was the solution of the problem? Well, Walter, I, I guess we go first to uh, what caused that moment, and what actually caused that moment was this switch right in the middle of the instrument panel. It's a, a switch that controls, uh, has the mode control for the abort guidance system. It was in automatic, in auto. It should have been in attitude hold. And that set off a strange series of circumstances. And what did happen, Scott? Well, Nelson, as I understand it, because this was not an attitude hold and they expected it to be, uh, they pointed toward the command module as soon as the program was initiated. What should have happened is that they should have held their attitude during the burn. And so Stafford? He used this attitude controller, the hand controller, Overrode and kept his attitude proper. Overrode the computer. So you tell one of these computers to do something and Walter, it apparently does it even if it's wrong until you come in and make the correction. The critical situation was they had to be in the right attitude to fire to get uh, back up toward the command module and that was the attitude that they were gyrating out of. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. <laughs> 